Hey folks, welcome back. I'm your host, RR Slugger, and I watched LEGO Dreams so you don't have to. <laughs> uh, it sounds dire, doesn't it? Um, and uh, yeah, it kind of is, it kind of is. Um, I did not enjoy my time with the show. 10 episodes, uh, each one being about 23 minutes. I watched them all on Netflix, um, but I know LEGO's drip feeding them on their YouTube channel, so if you wanna watch the show for free, you can. However, I don't recommend it. And um, I wanna spend some time today talking about why, and why this is such a, um, a disappointing revelation or disappointing reveal to the theme. So um, I wanna go through and try to avoid as much rambling as I can. So I've got my thoughts all written down here. I'm just gonna kinda go through it and uh, take it from there. The last time I tried to uh, record this video, I started with the positives and then went into the negatives later. Um, I don't know if I really wanna do that this time. I, I think I'm gonna lay it on thick right out of the gate here um, because it makes the most sense um, to talk about what the issues are and then kind of follow that up with what, uh, what successes the show has as well. So um, yeah, let's dive into it. Lego Dreams is a show about this group of friends known as the Dream Chasers who enter into the dream world, discovering how to craft and do fun adventures within it. And they are trying to stop um, someone known as the Nightmare King from taking over the dream world and uh, therefore the waking world. Um, it's an ensemble cast, and I will speak to that in a little bit here. And uh, the, the show moves a mile a minute, lots of plot points here. I don't really want to give a plot synopsis of every single episode, um, because a lot of it is just complicated, I think, for the sake of being complicated and not necessarily um, for the sake of complexity. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit here too, but I think by and large, I found the show to be rather rather vapid, <laughs> um, somewhat brainless entertainment. And um, unfortunately, I, I kind of think it's a dud, a bit of a failure to launch of a show. Uh, it just sort of feels like they took their target demographic of like ages six to maybe 10 and made the show specifically for those folks in that age range. Um, as a teacher, and I mean, obviously, I was once a child myself. <laughs> um, as a teacher who teaches kids, I just can't imagine anyone like above the age of 10 really finding this show intellectually stimulating. Although, I don't know, I grew up watching Star Trek as, as my childhood TV show, so what do I know? At least in my opinion, I think it's fair to say that the best kids shows are also written for adults as well. Uh, whether that be Miss Finsler quoting Pink Floyd in uh, Recess, or Optimus Primal reminiscing about die-cast construction in Beast Wars, Squidward fantasizing about the death that awaits him after working a minimum wage job in SpongeBob, like, those are all great examples of um, jokes that a kid might find humorous, but they lack the context to understand why it's humorous, and that's how those jokes are written for adults. And unfortunately, Lego Dreams has none of that. It, it it's, uh, really doesn't have, or doesn't make any attempts to write for an older demographic, which is strange for the Lego group, because unlike those other kids shows, the Lego group knows that a huge portion of its target user base is adults, ages 18 and up. So you'd think they would be trying to cater a little bit more towards that crowd as well, and um, try to find some of, some of the success that these other kids shows I've mentioned found as well. I also just want to point out too that it's not just my childhood nostalgia you know speaking for those shows there. I'll take an, an example of a kids show like The Last Airbender, Avatar The Last Airbender. That's a show I never watched as a kid. I watched it for the first time as, as an adult and it still spoke to me. Um, it still had enough quality writing to it. Um, so it can be done. You, you can write a kid's show that appeals to both kids and adults. Uh, it just takes a little bit more thought <laughs> than I think went into the Lego Dreams TV show. Speaking to the humor of Lego Dreams, I found the show to be rather unfunny, almost painfully unfunny. And I didn't expect that. I really expected it to be uh, a little bit more jovial and lighthearted and have some quality humor in it. Uh, I take like things like the Lego movie as an example or more modern example, I suppose. Um, but 
I got a laugh maybe once an episode. They got a laugh out of me maybe once an episode, which is low for me. That's really low. <laughs> I'm a person who loves to laugh. And here I was um, mostly silent during my viewing of Lego Dreams, um, sometimes groaning, but uh, <laughs> that was about it. Um, yeah, a lot of the things that were written to be jokes might amuse a six-year-old, but th there really isn't quality um, comedy writing here. The, the, the one or two that would get me in an episode, um, those, they felt like flukes. <laughs> or I was just laughing at how absurd something was. Um, yeah, so the show isn't very fun in that regard. It's not very humorous. My partner watched uh, some of the episodes with me and she had something insightful to say about it as well. Um, she talked about how the show is all exhale. It feels like it's always exhaling and there's no inhale. The show doesn't take any time to breathe. It really just moves and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened and without any regards to but therefore, it was just and then and then and then. A lot of tell, don't show as well. We get a lot of that in this show. Um, ironically, <laughs> um, but that, that, that's kind of where we're at. I, I felt that the first four episodes, the first four episodes of the show could have been the entire season. You could have taken the plot of the first four episodes where we meet our characters, they discover the dream world, they learn about dream crafting, and then they have to secure their hourglass in the dream forge. That's the plot of an entire season of television right there. And so Lego Dreams has the opposite problem that many streaming only shows have, where they take uh, four episodes of plot and stretch it out to 10. This one takes 10 episodes worth of plot and squishes it into four. And as a result, none of the moments have much weight or gravitas to them. We're not allowed to ruminate and to ponder the, the implications of what we're seeing on screen. It's very much just one uh, one directional writing where you're not really supposed to think back to what you just saw five minutes ago and uh, it, it's a writing cliche that I really hate. Now I haven't watched any of the other Lego modern TV shows, your Ninjagos, your Hidden Sides, whatever. I don't know how this one stacks up against those shows, um, but I think the problems that are that are here are quite paramount and um, can't really be brushed under the rug. I can't tell if the writers are trying to be funny or are trying to be insightful and just failing at both, <laughs> like some modern Star Trek show. It, it's really tough for me to tell and I don't have enough experience with this writing team to be able to decipher what's going on here. Um, though at the end of the day, I think the writing and the dialogue is pretty much at the heart of my problems with the show. So to that end, I want to talk about the cast. There is what is supposed to be an ensemble cast, but there's there's no mistaking it here. This is the Mateo show, and everyone else is just here as support. So amongst your characters here, you've got Mateo, who is by far the most fleshed out, most explored character, perhaps the most likable of the bunch as well too, I would say. Um, his sister Izzy, kind of a one-note character, just very impulsive and um, written to be, I, I guess, annoying as her character trait. I don't know. I don't know what they were going for there. Um, they both have a couple of friends in the show, uh, Cooper and Logan. I'll talk about Logan first. He's just your your dude bro character, and that's, that's basically that. <laughs> you can sum it up in one word, basically. Um, and the the character of Cooper, I am just completely dumbfounded by. I don't understand why this character is in the show at all. <laughs> like, every time they're on the screen, it, it, it's just negative charisma points. And I don't know if that's necessarily um, the, the voice actor they chose or if it's just the dialogue they wrote. But the way that it's supposed to, what we're told at least in, in this show is that Mateo used to be really good friends with Cooper, but then Cooper kind of grew up a little bit and now is really good friends with Logan. We're told both of those points. We're not really shown either of those points, to be honest. Um, it's just something we're supposed to accept is, is the fact. Um, but I don't understand from, from Mateo and Logan's perspective, what do they see in Cooper as a friend? <laughs> because Mateo and, and Logan are both quite charismatic and they have strong personalities. And Cooper's like a wet blanket of a character. Uh, I don't know why they want to be friends with him. <laughs> It might sound cruel to say that, but it's just not a believable friendship, I think. 
There is some attempt to give the characters depth, but it can all be summed up in a single sentence. I can take Mateo, for example, the most complicated character of the show, I would say, and basically say one sentence about him that sums up the character, everything you need to know. Um, Mateo is considerate and creative, but he needs to develop faith and confidence in his own ideas. That's basically the character. That's the whole thing right there. There is no, no nuance beyond that. And there really could be, there should be, I think, especially a show like this that is supposed to be, or at least we're told is supposed to be about inward inflection or inward reflection rather on our dreams. And uh, it really doesn't speak to that in the quality of writing. I know I'm coming off harsh towards the writing of the show here, but I, I do feel that is the, the root of the problem. Uh, the show is full of missed opportunities. Um, I'll, I'll give it a, a specific example as a microcosm of what I mean. In the second episode of the show, once Mateo and Izzy realize the dream world is real and their friend Cooper is trapped in the dream world, they prepare, they hatch a plan to go and rescue him. And what they do leading up to this moment is they start packing their backpacks full of things that they want to take into the dream world with them when they fall asleep is the idea. And so here they are, they're, they're stuffing their bags and they're talking about their plan, they're getting all pumped up and excited. and. I'm sitting here thinking, this is perfect. This is the perfect opportunity in the show to talk about that sleep training stuff that you were mentioning on the website, like Lego, part of that press release. They're talking about how uh, Lego Dreams is going to be a series that helps teach uh, kids and parents about sleep training and, and how to fall asleep better and that sort of stuff. And so in the show, here they are, they're getting super excited to go into the dream world. And I'm thinking, oh, it's perfect. It's just like Christmas. They can't fall asleep. They're so excited. And no, none of that happens. They, they, they're they asleep as soon as their head hits the pillow and we're into the dream world and off on an adventure. And I just think, what a missed opportunity. And it's it's one of so many as uh, I, come, I came up with so many different ideas as I was watching the show until eventually halfway through, I just kind of gave up because I realized the show wasn't going to capitalize on its dream world. It wasn't going to capitalize on that premise. You could call the dream world in this show, you could just call it Narnia or something, right? And replace all the words, all the mentions of dream with magic and very little would change. It, it, it basically is just a magical realm they go to that has very, very little to do with actually dreaming and, and what that implies about the about staying asleep or the waking world versus the dream world. What you might see in dreams being a reflection of what you, uh, what you experience in the waking world. None None of that's here except on very surface level, very surface level stuff. And it's a real shame because this is right out of the gate. This is the foundation of your universe. This is the foundation of your world. You have to get this part right. You can't retroactively go back and add more foundation to, to the building that you're building. Uh, the, the building's like foundation's done and it's very shaky. I hate to be the person that has to confirm what so many people in the comment section of my previous dreams video uh, were fearing, but it really is just surface level stuff. There, there is no deep thought um, put into the, the dream concept. And so all that talk in the press release seems to be just kind of, I don't know, fluff, <laughs> stuff of fairy tales, because it's not in the show. and. I don't see how it can be explored in the sets. So I think they just, they, they went full steam ahead into this dream world concept with just the understanding of like, oh, it's, we're just gonna use it to say it's random. It's a dream, it's, it's supposed to be random. But that's not really how dreams operate, is it, right? It, they, they're not just random far-fetched ideas. A lot of times they tie into what we're experiencing as people in the real world. And the the show doesn't make that connection. It doesn't tie the, the knot between the two. It just uses the dream world as a magical adventure scape where these kids can go run around and play. And this idea of they have the opportunity to wake up at any moment, it, it rarely comes up in the show. It's like in the last couple episodes of, of the season, they finally remembered that that is something you can do as a dreamer. <laughs> is you can wake up in a lot of the in a lot of cases, right? <laughs> and it's just like the entire show they forgot that that was an element of of dreams, <laughs> and then they they make some lip service to it at the very end of the show, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a shame. It's a real shame. 
So I've already mentioned Star Trek a couple of times here, <laughs> so you can you can see where my sort of um, what what I look for in a in a television show. I think <laughs> um, I, I'm looking for some more concrete rules. What are the rules of the dream world? And everything is kept so painfully vague here. Like for example, there are these hourglasses that dream crafters use to build things inside their dream. On the surface, I like this concept. I think this is cool. It adds a bit of a, um, a currency or, or a, a resource to the, the dream world where oftentimes dreams like could be represented with just being completely limitless, completely boundless, that sort of thing. So I like that this adds a finite resource to it. However, I don't feel like uh, it, it's it's explored deep enough. It, it, it basically just amounts to whenever the plot requires them to run out of dream sand, they run out of it. So that, that that's somewhat annoying, uh, somewhat frustrating. For this being a Lego show, it certainly doesn't have much to do with Lego. There is no emphasis on building. In fact, I don't think there's any bricks to be seen in the show. The only Lego elements are the minifigures themselves, not even the accessories they hold. Like there, there was an episode where a character has a walkie-talkie on their hip and they, they keep picking it up and talking to the walkie-talkie and it's it's never it's never the Lego walkie-talkie. It's, it's just some 3D asset that was created. And I don't know if that's typical of Ninjago or Hidden Side as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was really distracting uh, to to see these Lego characters in a world that isn't made for them. <laughs> I think in the beginning of the show, I was tepidly optimistic. I uh, watched the first couple episodes, and while I definitely had problems with them, I thought the show was on decent footing. But it, it really went downhill towards the middle of the middle of the season. There, uh, by episode five, I was actively disliking the show. I think this uh, this stupid Yeti thing broke me. <laughs> At this point, I was like, what are we doing? Is this a Lego show or not? Uh, because this thing looks like it was pulled out of Pure Imagination Studios' asset library, like like a piece of clip art or something. It, it also shows off the corporate doublespeak at play here. On one hand, the Lego group builds this series as its most diverse ever, yet on the other hand, it seems content to leave in moments like this where the joke seems to be that the Yeti has a deep voice and is wearing makeup. Like, that's the joke! <laughs> Cross-dressing gags? Like, these were popular in kids' shows 30 years ago. Is this still where we're at? At, at least I, I think it was supposed to be a joke. The show is so flipping unfunny that I can't tell what's what's meant to be humorous and what isn't. So I don't know. I don't know. Like like if you're if you're trying to find the humor in this show, you need like an archaeology team with those little brushes, you know, to excavate it. it it's it's ridiculous. The show sees a little bit of redemption towards the end. I feel like the last few episodes are much stronger than what came before. Um, but a lot of it is a little too little, too late. The, like I mentioned earlier, the foundation is, is shoddy, and so it's hard to build past that. You can't retcon um, depth into your world design. <laughs> so, um, one, one notable element here that I love the concept of, loved the concept of, uh, was this thing called the Edison Bomb, which is a device that the dream chasers can use. It's like a grenade, like a bomb, and it, it emits pure sunlight, which will destroy any grim spawn, which are the nightmare shadow things. It will destroy any grim spawn around it, but if you have to shield your eyes from it, because if you look directly into it, it'll wake you up instantly. And I love this concept. What a great, well-designed idea for, you know, some, something that is actually using the, the dream concept, the fact that we are in a dream right now. <laughs> and um, they promptly waste this item. <laughs> Uh, it's Chekhov's Edison bomb. <laughs> uh, I just, I can't have nice things. So I've been ripping on the show here pretty hard. So l let me talk about some of the positive aspects. Um, the show is pretty. It, it, it's vi very visually inviting. It's, it's not too dark and um, it's also not 
color barf, which is the opposite extreme where the saturation's all cranked up and all that sort of stuff. I found it, it hit a nice middle ground between the two. Um, so that, that's great. Uh, the, the colors are nice, the animation's smooth, everything looks pleasing. I think the sound design is all right, definitely serviceable. Um, the score is quite good. I, I quite liked the music in the show. Um, the theme song, that sort of stuff, it, it's, it's good. It's good stuff. The voice acting, I, I don't know, it's kind of hit or miss. It's, it's all right for the most part. Um, I really feel like a big name voice actor um, in the main ensemble cast would have really helped. Um, just, just like I don't know, get, getting someone, someone famous to do Mr. Oz, for example. I thought I heard Jennifer Hale in one episode. I'm pretty sure she's in one, um, and I, I definitely thought I heard David, David K in another. Um, but I checked on the David K one, and it wasn't, unfortunately. But a lot of this just kind of makes me think, like, like, well, what are these folks up to these days? You know, like, what's Scott McNeil doing these days? I, like, I, I'm sure Matthew Ewald would love to work with the Lego Group again. Like, like get one of these guys to come in and, and do some voices. With that being said, the one standout character, at least from a voice acting department, is the Nightmare King. He is so over the top and just chewing the scenery. I, I love it, especially when you have a villain like this that is just one note, blah, ha, ha, I am evil because I'm evil, that sort of thing. You really need to have an actor that can sell that and just love being viciously evil. And the Nightmare King is good in that regard. It, it's it's I know it's a one note villain, completely one dimensional villain, but when you sell it with a performance like this, I think it works. This one's going to be a bit of a backhanded compliment <laughs> because I've already mentioned how the show very poorly represents dreams. Um, like, like there, there, there are certain episodes where what is supposedly being dreamed by a character I, it, to me, it just seems like nonsense. Uh, this this one episode, uh, a character in it is dreaming herself being a baby, and so she's running around and and you know goo goo gaga -ga, that sort of stuff. Uh, and to me, that's just nonsensical. Does anyone actually remember being a baby? And if so, like, is this something that people dream about? Uh, it, it just seems like they just kind of pulled that out of their hat and uh, just, just went with it. But there is one single episode where I feel like they get the dream concept right. They actually have something that I feel like is a good representation of what people dream about. And it's in episode four where they're in the dream forge and Matteo is having a nightmare and his nightmare includes him losing his hands he just doesn't have hands it's not like it's graphic or anything like that like his hands haven't been chopped off it's just they're not there he can't utilize them so he's trying to pick up his pencil and he can't he can't pick it up he's trying to open the door he can't open the door this is good this is really good stuff and I remember very um very keenly <laughs> being aware that hey this is the first time in this show that I actually feel like I'm in a dream world that I'm actually in a dream and uh, the the scene itself really reminded me of Nathan Sawaya's work and I know that's maybe an unfair comparison because <laughs> Nathan Sawaya makes incredibly thought-provoking pieces of art and if you ever get a chance to see them in person you have to yeah it, it's it's a really um, really insightful experience um, but uh, yeah it, that was that was I think the show at its best in terms of representing the dream world so that kind of rounds out um, what I felt were positive aspects of the show. <laughs> There's other like little nitpicky things I could I could dig at as uh, some of the music choices and, and such. Um, there's an episode where a character is listening to classical music and I recognized a few of the tunes but uh, towards the end she, she pulls out a, a vinyl record of the best of Mozart and puts it on and I'm I'm pretty sure the song that plays is not Mozart. I'm pretty sure it's Vivaldi but I, I could be wrong. I haven't checked it. I haven't checked that. Likewise, Zoe's playing electric guitar in one scene of the episode, but it's actually an electric bass because it only has four strings, four tuners. So, you know, li little things like that. You know, you can nitpick that away. Um, but by and large, I think it, it's it's more um, more the big scale problems that the show has, the, the foundational problems where the, the dream world is just not firmly established. 
uh, the rules of what goes on there isn't it, like they're not clear and the dream world itself doesn't feel like a dream world to me it just feels like a magical fantastical realm it, it, it feels like narnia it doesn't feel like a dream there's this alan parsons song it's called where's the walrus and i got thinking about this as i was watching the show so where's the walrus? It's based on something that uh, a man named Lee Abrams said to Alan Parsons around that era. It, it basically, Alan Parsons' music was getting, you know, derivative. It was it was missing that that spark that it had early on. And so Lee Abrams told him, like, where where's the walrus, man? Where is it? And so he's referring to "I Am the Walrus," the the Beatles song, which is um, obviously quite quite a. Uh, uh, profound piece of music, I think, in a lot of regards. And so, with LEGO Dreams, I'm wondering, where's the walrus? <laughs> where's the hook? Is there a hook? I, I, I thought the show would be the hook, because in my first episode, or my first video talking about LEGO Dreams, I was already kind of confused. I, I was kind of scratching my head, thinking, okay, I don't know what the hook is, but I guess, you know, here we go. I guess we'll try out the show and we'll see. Um, and now, having watched the show, I'm certainly not hooked on the characters or the world or the toys. The, the show is a poor toy commercial, because nothing about it uh, is LEGO, the, just, just the minifigures. So even when we see things like, uh, the, the crocodile car appear in an episode later on it's there for like 30 seconds and it hardly looks like the lego set because it's a 3d render uh, so i don't know maybe maybe that's an unfair criticism because it, it could be a, a lose-lose situation for the lego group either they make the show like it's a toy commercial and they get blasted because it's just a toy commercial or they make the show like this where it's not a toy commercial and then they get blasted because it's not a toy commercial so i don't know all in all, it's 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 rather frustrating uh, because I went into LEGO Dreams optimistic and here I was hoping the show would add depth to the concepts outlined in the press release, but I'm afraid the exact opposite is true. So now it's up to the sets to deliver and um, I don't know, hopefully they can manage to pull another Galador out of their hat in that regard uh, because the, the show is nothing to write home about. I guess we'll see what happens on August 1st. I still plan on picking up a few of the sets, um, but I, the, the show itself has not convinced me <laughs> of, of the theme. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's unsettling a little bit. Um, it's kind of a bold move, I suppose, to lead with a rather mediocre cartoon series <laughs> before your toy line comes out. Uh, I don't know if that's, that's the right call here. And um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in closing, there's this story, and I, I can't confirm the, the truth of it, but I've, I know I've read it a few times, uh, about Galador. I'm going to bring up Galador again, where the LEGO designers, you know, they built the sets, and they, they were in love with the theme, and they're getting it all working and all that, all that jazz, and they had hired a television company to create the TV show. And the, they're both hard at work in their own separate camps. And later on, the TV show kind of wrapped and they, they sent their, their footage and um, uh, whatnot back to the LEGO group and the LEGO designers watched it and were appalled. They were horrified with what they saw. <laughs> and all at once they felt, oh no, this is going to tank. Like, like, like we're in trouble. This is, this is really bad. Uh, and well, I don't think the show, I don't think the show of, Gal of Galador is really all that bad. Uh, I can't help but feel like uh, something similar might have happened here, um, where I, I just can't imagine a Lego designer who put so much time and thought into their set and to see it represented for all of 30 seconds on screen and just be a generic 3D render of it and not really look like the set at all. I can't imagine they would be that pleased with what, what the results are here. I, I just, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't feel like the Lego designers on this series can feel proud of, of this show. And, and that, that's unfortunate because it was outside of their hands. So I, I really feel for them in that regard. And for, for the people who worked on the show itself, while there are certain elements I think uh, deserve, like deserve being proud of, um, I, I think overall it's, it's just rather mindless entertainment. So, I don't know, yeah. I don't think I'll be checking out season two, I'll, I'll say that much. Anyways, that's uh, those are my thoughts on LEGO Dreams. 
I don't recommend going out and watching it. I, I think there's nothing of value that the show adds to the series. And that's uh, <laughs> that's a big problem in it, in of itself right there. <laughs> the whole point of the series is to help flesh out the world. And it does a very poor job of fleshing it out. So I think just stick with the sets. Um, yeah, don't go towards the series. Don't 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 uh, don't watch it for context because I don't think the context helps. <sighs> oh, all right, all right. I I think I'll call it there. <laughs> I still have a few things I want to talk about in regards to Lego Dreams, but I will probably save that for a follow-up video. Something far shorter than this, though. Um, until then, I've been your host R R Slugger, and I'll see you next time for another video.